Right. Well, uh, I think we're a couple of minutes past half past. Uh, I can see we've got we're, we've got uh, over sixty five people now on board. So I'm sure hopefully a few others join. But there's a great great level of attendance. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, this uh, event. Focus very much on unlocking Hampshire's potential. Continuing the series of events that um, we've been uh, co-hosting uh, with my with my colleagues Kerry Moore from NatWest and Peter Taylor from Hampshire Chamber of Commerce. So delighted to be here again, very much continuing the theme of focusing around um, ESG, but I think this time with a particular focus on the net zero agenda. Um, we've got a, 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 busy, a busy session ahead of us, but I just wanted to pass on maybe a few reflections from myself from what we've heard over the last couple of events that we've ran. Um, looking back, we've heard from some scientists, Dr. Ben Moat, uh, of the world-renowned National Oceanography Centre. And then we also may recall those who have joined us in the past hearing from a leading academic on climate change and business strategy, Sarah Ivory. We've also then heard from business leaders at the likes of Fat Face and Barfoots of Botley on their own sustainability strategies and the journeys that they've been on so far. And for me, what struck home both in the previous sessions and discussions and also the interaction I've had with clients over recent months is how businesses really now, now grab hold of the sustainability climate change agenda, along with government. But the fact that business has grabbed hold of it, I think is really now powering ahead what is addressing potentially uh, the biggest issue facing society that we've seen in a, in a generation. I say this not because I think we've got reporting requirements around carbon emissions, uh, which undoubtedly many of us are having to address in our sort of financial reporting, which I know well. But I think more importantly, because the stakeholder community of investors, staff, suppliers, and indeed, most importantly, probably our customers want to know what our businesses are doing to embrace sustainability and address the challenges of climate change. So for me, what I've really learned is that addressing climate change is not a regulatory reporting requirement. It's not just an ask of government. It's now a commercial imperative for our businesses. And I think when you look at those really leading in this space, they're not seeing it just as a commercial imperative. They're seeing it as a real commercial opportunity. And when I think of it like that, I, look, I struck me that I think back to when we heard from Sarah Ivory and, and she left us with, with um, a real challenge to think about that struck with me. And I, I, I'll quote her that she put up a proposal. She challenged us to think that a business exists to support a thriving society by producing goods and services and in doing so, makes a profit. And that really stuck with me and resonated that why, why, why is this important? It is important to society. There is a strong commercial imperative here as well. So anyway, moving on to this morning, uh, just in case you don't know me, my name is Julian Gray. I'm a senior partner of PwC in Southampton. Um, as I mentioned, I'm joined by Peter Taylor of Hampshire Chamber uh, and Kerry Moore of NatWest. But I'm delighted this morning that we've got three speakers to build on this critical agenda and Nick Baker is joining us um, from the Cabinet Office. He's a Deputy Director. He isn't on yet because he's had challenges with the train, but he should be joining us very shortly. And Nick joins us from the Cabinet Office responsible for COP26. So Nick's going to share the, what we learned from COP26, what went well, the successes, probably some of the things he would like to have seen further progress, but also start to talk to us about um, COP27 and the agenda there, which is being held in, in Egypt. I'm also delighted. And we'll turn to, to them first. We're joined by Steve Salazzi, uh, the Operations Director for Southampton Apple, and Gemma Lacey, Director of Sustainability and Communications from Southern Coal. So I welcome to our guests this morning. We're going to hear from uh, Steve first and then Gemma on the strategies that the airport and the Southern Coal have been taking to address sustainability. I haven't mentioned we are recording this morning and we will be sharing the recording afterwards through the Chamber and hopefully some highlights that we've shared out. So thank you for joining us, and I shall hand over to Steve. Thank you very much. Can you see me and hear me, Julian? We can, Steve. Excellent. Right. So let me introduce myself. Then. So I'm uh, Steve Soloy, um, your standard everyday Hungarian Geordie. Um, I run Southampton Airport and I work for AGS. Uh, AGS stands for Aberdeen, Glasgow and Southampton Airport. 
And my background is the army. I was the army for, for 20 years, Colonel in the Rimi, Afghanistan 2010, left in 2012, and I've been in aviation now for nearly 10 years. And I run an airport, so why am I here talking about environment and sustainability? I can already hear some of you shouting greenwash through your muted microphones, um, but we're a big business and we're a big local business as well. We need to be included in the debate. Uh, aviation is not going to go away. We, we need to be engaged, not excluded. Also, our staff demand it. We have 500 on the airport. It used to be 1,200 before COVID and Flybe. They want to do their bit as well. They want to be in, in, involved. And also, we, we represent millions of, of passengers. Um, and we can't simply demonise millions of passengers for, um, for using aviation. So I'm very grateful for the, for the platform and, and the opportunity. When I came into aviation, sustainability, it was something that was talked about, but it wasn't really part of the DNA of the aviation business. And then something happened around 2017, 2018. I'm sure it's the same in a lot of your industries. Society as a whole seemed to, seemed to wake up. And now sustainability within aviation is right up there with safety and security. And as we recover from COVID, it's absolutely at the top of the agenda. Our staff and our passengers simply demand action. So um, obviously there's an elephant in the room, the extension. Um, I'm not here to talk about the runway extension, but obviously I can't ignore it. It's, it's very contentious. And the update is there'll be a judicial review in April. I hope to be building the extension in Q3 and Q4 of this year, 2022. And we should be ready for operations for the summer of 23. And the extension, it has to be seen as a balance with jobs and the economy on one hand, noise in the environment on the other, and only you can decide where you put that balance. But I'm not here to talk about that today. There's already been 20 hours of public debate, 8,000 people have written into the council as part of the consultations, and I suspect every one of you has already made up your mind which side scales come down for you. So what I do want to address is um, what we're doing as a business to address sustainability and our carbon footprint. And, and the key thing for me here is to have all these other businesses involved here. And maybe we can compare notes, get some ideas and, uh, and, and collaborate across the business network. So in doing this, I'm going to step down through the hierarchy of the aviation industry. Um, I'm going to go through aviation industry, AGS group, and then Southampton Airport. And as I step down through those levels, I'll be asking you to think about what parallels, uh, if any, you have. So bigger businesses, maybe at that sort of strategic level. And then as we get down to the smaller businesses, maybe there's parallels and things we can do to help you at the, uh, at the practical and at the sharp end. So at the big level, at the, at the um, uh, you know, we're, we're a big organisation, uh, we're a big business, we're lucky to have an industry voice. And I don't know if... if your industries have such a voice. We have the Airport Operators Association uh, and internationally we have ICAO. We've recently just signed the Toulouse Declaration um, and that's government and industry committing together uh, a major statement of intent. Now that's obviously big picture long term. But what I see here is a, is a, real, a real role for the Chamber in uniting smaller businesses and maybe organizations, organizations like us can, can help be part of your collective voice. Uh, and maybe we're through the chamber, there's some sort of joint declaration of intent that smaller businesses can sign up to as our bigger businesses uh, do. Um, in my industry, the big picture includes things like sustainable aviation fuel, staff, uh, SAF, uh, electric aircraft, hydrogen, Corsair, the offsetting scheme, and international aviation is, is looking to be net zero by 2050. Now, again, for some people, those goals, uh, noble though they may be, they seem too aloof, too far away, and it's easy to throw the, the, the greenwash label at them. But Glasgow have already had flights powered by SAF. And in the UK, um, we're really well set. We've got the Channel Islands, uh, really important for us at Southampton. We've got the Scottish Highlands and Islands. They're perfect routes for trialing electric aircraft in the next two years, not five, 10 years away, but in the next two years. So that's the big picture. Of course, big picture is great, but at Southampton Airport, we don't really control much of that, but we do have a group level. So I'm gonna now step down a level to AGS to the group level and talk about what we do as a group. 
and, and again, see if there's any pointers for your business. So at AGS, I, I think what you have to ask yourself, are you big enough to have a dedicated member of staff or even a department? And we're very fortunate that in AGS, we've got a director, a director of sustainability at our headquarters in, in, in Glasgow. Now that comes with a serious budget, a serious budget for sustainability, including, for example, the ability to build a solar farm at Glasgow Airport in the next two years. And rest assured, I'll be bidding for one at our airport when we get through the extension and then we're building the Freeport uh, tax site on our land. It also means we've got the horsepower to strategize and to write documents such as the sustainability strategy for the group. And as most of you in, in big business know, these aren't just glossy brochures, but they're statements of intent from shareholders. And those shareholders are willing to invest capital, cash to turn, turn it into reality. A glossy brochure means that there's a costed plan behind it, which is endorsed at board level. It also means the group give me very, very clear orders about things such as, I want Southampton to be carbon neutral. They want us to achieve ISO 14001 and also be part of Gresby. And I'll just explain them in a, in, in a bit more detail. Gresby is the, and I really recommend it for bigger businesses. Uh, Gresby is the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmarking Scheme, GRESB. Now we submit our data, we're compared against a wide range of other businesses, major industries, I'm delighted to say that at Southampton Airport, we came out as the best UK airport and second in Europe from those airports that take part, about 30 airports. Similarly, I saw 14,001, that's the environmental management standard, the international standard for environmental management. And we achieved that last year. And for businesses who might think they, they wanna go down that route, I would be delighted to host a visit from major companies who feel it's something that they want to explore, we can grab a coffee and we can show you how we approached it and the processes that we've put in place and how we were audited against it. I also at group level get sustainability KPIs, so recycling targets for things such as uh, zero landfill. So now I'm going to step down to the to the airport level. And this may be more applicable to the, to the smaller businesses who are, who are on here. Um, I think the first thing to say is staffing. Um, previously, sustainability, it was, it was blistered onto the safety rule. I'm not really sure why, um, but for 2022, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we're splitting the role into two. We're going to have one manager for safety and another dedicated manager for sustainability. And I'd be interested to know for smaller businesses, um, how you get that level of support? How do you get access to a sustainability professional when you don't have the resources in-house? And again, maybe that's a challenge for the, for the chamber or for other business organizations to provide that expertise um, and to provide some way, you know, a shared communal expert. Um, I'd be delighted to be involved in something like that where maybe our sustainable, sustainability manager could come along and, and you could all benefit from their, from their experience. And because uh, this is really one of those uh, areas where we all need to benefit from each other's actions and we need to do what we can together to, uh, to accelerate uh, the actions and spread uh, best practice. So I mentioned as an airport that we're carbon neutral, of course that's just the airport, again I can hear greenwash being shouted, what's really important to understand is our boundary, it doesn't include the aircraft in flight, um, that's the realm of the airlines and their own scheme, we're the airport. Um, so let me just touch on, on carbon neutral for a minute and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the wider network of businesses in the supply chain. Um, airlines, they see us airports, they, they see us as part of their supply chain. And some airlines like EasyJet, they really do hold us to account. Uh, they wanna see evidence that we're taking this seriously. And similarly in our airport supply chain, we're looking to the businesses on the airport, such as ground handlers, to show us their plans, and we set them targets such as you know electric vehicle fleet by 2025. And it's important that everybody is checking everybody else's homework because the passenger, the passenger is very demanding. I get all sorts of letters about plastic straws, recycling bins. And whilst it might seem small fry, these small actions obviously all add up. So when you think about carbon neutral, it's it's quite a formal exercise, and we employ consultants to analyze our operation tell us what our carbon footprint is, 
and perhaps you've heard of uh, scopes one, two, and three. If not, then I hope with, with the chamber, we can help educate you and inform you of the process. It's not hard, it's really not hard, it's not difficult. It's just some new terminology that we're all gonna have to get used to and we're all gonna have to learn. And, uh, and in my sort of, you know, uh, clumsy, uh, grand scheme where I will try and explain scopes one, two, and three to you. Scope one, put simply, it's the carbon that your business emits, um, you know, so it's your vehicles, your, uh, your infrastructure. Scope two is the uh, energy from rene renewable sources. So make sure if you can get your electricity from renewable sources, it's quite a simple win. Um, scope one, for example, things like smart meters, uh, to identify where you're burning your electricity and what time's really simple, really cost effective, and they'll pay for themselves within, within a couple of months. And then scope three is the wider part of the business. So, for example, if you have construction projects, um, making sure you use the principles of the circular economy and have a look at what Foley Waterside are doing. Uh, go and pinch their wonderful ideas. I mean, they're, they're very keen to, to share what they're doing, which is absolutely best practice. And we're very lucky to have that in the air. Uh, in the local area. Similarly, we have a thing called FEGP, Fixed Electrical Ground Power. So when the aircraft do come on and they don't have to use their engines for power light heat, we can plug them into uh, to our renewable electricity source. And then there's all sorts of things there like cycle to work schemes and encouraging the use of public transport. Now, when you've calculated your carbon footprint, you then ask, well, what do you do about it? And this is where we use offsetting. And, and I'm surprised, but offsetting is quite contentious. I'm not really sure why. Maybe some, some people can educate us on that. Because we use the United Nations gold standard. I'm sure that, it doesn't get much better than the United Nations gold standard, does it? But we you get to select a scheme and a location, and we've already supported uh, wind farms in Asia, and now we're supporting a Ugandan cook stove project. So we pay the credits that offset the cost of our tons of CO2, and that helps fund these programs which are reducing carbon production in their, in their areas. And another um, small initiative, but very useful uh, that we're doing is we're giving our staff two extra days uh, on top of their holiday uh, so that they can volunteer for, um, for local charities and, uh, and local initiatives. So, so let me summarize then. So at the big picture, I think it's important to have some sort of statement of intent, and that could be at your industry business level, um, again, I think there's a role for the chamber there to unite the smaller businesses so that smaller businesses can coalesce. And similarly as well, smaller businesses who can't have dedicated staff in this field, I think there's a, there's a thing there where the chamber can bring the various sustainability experts together so that you can leverage their expertise. Um, and we, I'd be happy to, to take part in that. And, um, and then uh, consider for bigger businesses whether you want to get involved in things like Gresby or ISO 14001, I'd be delighted to, to uh, host an event where you come and see what we're doing on that and what's involved with that. And then for smaller businesses, carbon offsetting or some sort of uh, carbon reduction schemes and obviously the local initiatives that I'm sure you've all got, because certainly in our industry, our passengers and our staff demand it. Now, I think we're going to take questions at the end. I think it's my job now to hand over to Gemma Lacey from Southern Co-op. Thanks, Steve. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just a bit of an introduction to, to myself. Uh, so I am the Director of Sustainability and Communications with Southern Co-op. And I've been working in the sustainability field now for, gosh, over 20 years. Um, so nine years with um, Southern Co-op, celebrating my anniversary actually this week, um, but I've also worked for a range of other organisations, um, including The Body Shop, uh, a spell of time with KPMG and the consultancy side of things, um, and also with the John Lewis Partnership. Um, but I thought I'd start with just giving a little bit of an introduction to Southern Co-op for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, so first slide, please. So we are an independent regional uh, cooperative society. Uh, we were founded um, in 1873, so uh, next year we'll be celebrating our 150th anniversary. We trade across um, 11 counties uh, in the south of England, um, and we have over 4,000 colleagues 
Um, and as a co-op, we are uh, work for the benefit of our communities. So we have those cooperative values and principles, um, and we're owned by our 130,000 uh, colleague and customer members. So our key business areas are food retail, which is by far the largest part of our business. Uh, so we now have over 200 uh, convenience food stores um, across our, our region. We also have an end of life services business. Um, so that um, includes funeral care. Uh, we have a couple of crematoria, one in Havant, one in East Devon, uh, a natural burial ground um, in Sussex. And we've just recently acquired three woodland burial sites as well. And then the final strand of our business, we actually operate um, a coffee shop franchise under the Starbucks um, master brand. Um, and we now have um, 50 coffee shops. So next slide, please. So I think as a regional um, business and a local business, we acknowledge and recognize that we've got a part to play in addressing the global challenges. Um, so part of our overall business planning um, approach, we've uh, wanted to align ourselves with the global goals, what I like to term the world's to-do list. So as part of our strategic plan, we've identified three of those goals where we believe that we can have the greatest influence and impact. So one of those is climate action, um, which is what I'm going to focus on talking about some of the things that we're doing in that area today. But that has also links with the other two goals that we've identified. So all about building sustainable uh, cities and communities and looking at what we as a business can do to uh, source our products and our services uh, in a sustainable way and to promote responsible consumption. So next slide, please. So we've been measuring our carbon footprint since 2012. Um, so first step is obviously to understand what those, those impacts, impacts are. Um, and we've made great progress. So Steve's talked a little bit about the different types of emissions. So from an operational side, energy is absolutely by far the biggest area of that footprint. Um, and is where we have focused our efforts um, to date with initiatives like introducing low energy efficient lighting, doors on our chiller units um, and other things like that. And we've made some great progress, but back in 2020, I think given the global imperative, we decided that we just weren't going far enough, fast enough. So we've reviewed and refreshed our climate ambition, and that's been under the stewardship of, uh, we've set up a climate action group, uh, which is actually chaired by our chief executive and includes people from our property uh, finance teams um, and myself. And we've worked to redefine what that climate ambition is and to set some more ambitious targets um, and put in place a supporting plan to deliver those. So I just wanted to share a little bit about what our footprint looks like. So on the left hand side, this is our kind of baseline. As you can see, it's made up of all of those emissions relating to our operations, energy usage, transport. We have company cars, um, end of life services, vehicle fleet and some other vehicles. Our distribution is outsourced. So that sits in, in our indirect footprint. Um, and then we also have emissions associated with our um, refrigeration. So as you can imagine, retail stores, lots of refrigeration. But as you can see from the right hand side, you know, that indirect footprint. So those um, emissions associated with our products, our suppliers and the use of our products by our customers is by far the greatest area. Uh, and 55 percent of those emissions actually relate to the goods and the services that we sell. So in redefining and setting that ambition, it was really important for us that we looked at both those areas and set some bold commitments to, to see what we could do to reduce those, those two. So next slide, please. So at the top, um, you'll see that we've now uh, set some targets um, which reflect the latest science. Um, and they, uh, they basically are aligned to what we need to do as a business to reduce those emissions required globally uh, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So we're looking at uh, cutting our operational emissions by 50% uh, by 2030, and then those indirect emissions by 17% um, by 2030. Now, clearly those indirect emissions are gonna be harder for us uh, to, to get after, but nonetheless, we're looking at ways um, to do that. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. And obviously setting the targets is, not necessarily the easy part because they're bold and ambitious targets, but clearly it's really important to have a clear plan and pathway that sits beneath that, that sets out how we're going to deliver those. 
And this slide gives you an example of some of those things, but importantly, we've put the investment behind it and an initial investment of 5.8 million um, to support that activity. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the things that we're doing as a business and hopefully might provide some inspiration for yourselves as well. Um, so from an operational perspective, um, as I talked about, we've done a lot already on energy efficiency, but the big sort of area for us is still refrigeration. So we're looking at replacing um, our older kind of obsolete refrigeration equipment, looking actually about whether we need that refrigeration equipment in the first place. We're looking at replacing refrigeration gases with those that have a lower global warming impact. Um, and we're also rolling out on the bottom uh, left-hand side a new te technology which is actually based on Formula One technology called EcoBlades. And basically they are clipped to the side of the shelves and help to keep the cool air in and the hot air out and improve the overall efficient efficiency of those refrigeration cabinets. So lots of innovation in technology, also looking at photo uh, photovoltaics. Um, we've put those in place across a number of areas in our estate. And then the top left corner, looking at what we can do to support the transition to electric vehicles. Um, and we've just recently taken um, purchase of the first, it was the UK's first fully electric um, hearse. So moving on to the next slide. So that gives you a flavor of just some of the things that will be big focus areas for us um, on our operations. Um, but when it comes to those indirect emissions, um, as a co-op, we're an independent co-op and we're actually part of a, a national buying agreement. So there's an organization called Federal Retail Trading Services, which actually purchases and buys all of the products, the vast majority of the products that we sell within our retail stores. Um, and they do that on behalf of the co-op group and a number of the other independent cooperative, cooperative societies um, around the UK. And clearly there are benefits for us as part of being that um, part of that buying agreement but it does also mean that that supply chain isn't directly controlled by us so we're very much reliant on the work of co-op group who are the national co-op and who manage that supply chain um, to, to look at what they can do to reduce those emissions and the good news is they've kind of set their own ambitious targets they're looking to reduce product related emissions by 11 percent and they are doing a lot of work with their farmers uh, academics agricultural suppliers to really look at what they can do within those supply chains and particularly around the areas of beef and dairy. They're also looking at increasing packaging recyclability and removing peat uh, from the growing media from sale entirely. So all of those things we will benefit from as a business and we are looking at how we can work with them collaboratively to support those goals. Similarly on the Starbucks side, again they've set their own sort of emissions targets um, and they are focusing dairy accounts for 23% of their product emissions. Uh, and they have a big program of work around um, environmental stewardship with their uh, dairy uh, supplier, Arla. So lots of sorts of things, we're relying on those um, other relationships, but there are of course some things that we can do directly in that area um, that will reduce those emissions as well, such as looking at tackling food waste, um, and also what we can do as a customer facing business to really, I guess, make it as easy and simple for our customers to make sustainable choices as well. So that might be installing uh, charging electric vehicle charging points at our stores um, or actually increasing the range of plant based foods that we offer. And we're making sure that all of those are actually no more expensive than their meat based alternatives. Next slide, please. And I think particularly with that customer piece, communications plays a really key part. You know, we've got a role as a business to help educate, build understanding and awareness of not just what we're doing as a business, um, but the part that our members, our colleagues um, and other stakeholders can play as well. So when we, um, Nick, I know is going to talk about COP26 in a little bit more detail, but we use that opportunity to highlight the climate summit, what it was all about. Um, the part that we're playing as a business, but also to start to provide some inspiration and ideas through our social media, uh, marketing emails, uh, membership emails, and also our in-store point of sale materials about things that people could do in their own time to actually uh, make more sustainable choices. Next slide, please. 
So I do want to touch on the fact that, um, you know, we are facing a climate crisis, but also an ecological one as well. So our natural world is being significantly impacted by climate change. And actually, if we're going to achieve these climate aspirations and the net zero um, aspirations that businesses are setting, then we need nature for that. So it's really important that as part of those climate action plans, we as a business are supporting nature recovery and helping to build, bring wildlife back to our land and seas. So our biggest green spaces on our estate are around our crematoria, natural and woodland burial grounds. So we've been working with the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust in particular to develop biodiversity action plans for those sites. So to, so to understand what wildlife we have there and what enhancements we can make uh, for the benefit of wildlife, but also that brings a benefit to those sites as well and the people that are visiting them. And those partnerships extend not just beyond what we can do as a business to make our business wilder, um, but also what we can do in our communities as well. Um, and Portsmouth is um, one of the most kind of developed businesses um, areas outside of London, so not a huge amount of green infrastructure. Um, so we're working again with, through an initiative called Wilder Portsmouth to look at how we can green the city um, through wilder streets, um, garden spaces and creating other green spaces. And also a big part of that is around education and building people's understanding of the, pro the importance and role of nature within that city. Next slide, please. And I think hopefully that just gives you a flavour of some of the kind of initiatives and actual sort of activity that we're undertaking. But a big important part for us is about how we embed sustainability into every aspect of what we do. So we've developed a tool called our Southern Co-op Compass, which is helping us really bring that sustainability lens to all of the decisions that we're making as a business, particularly those that relate to strategic plans, procurement, um, and our capital investment, so that when we're looking at new proposals, uh, we have a way of kind of sense checking and understanding what the sustainability um, and other kind of opportunities might be, not just from an impact perspective, but opportunities as well, so that those decisions really are informed and that we're balancing not just the commercial and financial agenda for the business, but also our sustainability commitments as well. And final slide, please. So I think it's really important for us all as businesses to, um, to really own the problem and accept that the climate crisis is ours to fix. And we're obviously all needing to take action to, to cut carbon, build resilience within our own business to the future effects of climate change, um, which are very much some of those are being felt now and through our supply chains. And I guess apply the same level, a level of energy to delivering and rewarding those financial outcomes um, as the, sorry, the sustainability um, outcomes as the financial ones. So I'm sharing here, there's lots of useful tools um, out there. And I think as Steve said, you know, we can share good practices and ideas and inspirations um, as a business as well. Uh, but this one is from Business in the Community. Um, and they've done some recent survey research to show which uh, climate actions people are really looking to businesses to take. And that's around using less energy materials, protecting nature and biodiversity and cutting those emissions. And they've created a seven steps for climate change. So I think if you're a business that's already on this pathway, um, it's a great way to just look at things more holistic and think of some other ways and, and uh, things to be looking at and considering as part of that climate journey. And if you're not actually already on that pathway, then it provides a helpful framework to start to think about some of the important things to do whether that's just looking at measuring your impact in the first place, embedding that within strategy, um, making that those actual goals and commitments and looking about how you mobilize your different sort of stakeholders, including colleagues and customers behind what you're trying to achieve. So I hope that's provided um, some inspiration and, and ideas from what we're doing as a business. And I think hopefully um, through this network, we've got an opportunity to really collaborate, share ideas, share inspiration and solutions um, because clearly this is such a big issue none of us can do this um, in isolation thank you and i think i'm going to hand over to nick now <laughs> thanks jen great morning nick over to you 
Good morning, everyone. Hi, Julian. Um, I'm just trying to start my video. There we go. And sorry to be joining the meeting late uh, with problems on the trains this morning. That's the, one of the downsides of being back in the office. Can I, can I check whether everyone can hear and see me? I can see that my microphone looks like it's working, but not sure about my video. There you go. You've come up, Nick. We can see you, see you now as well and hear you. Brilliant. OK, thank you. And thank you to Gemma and to Steve for um, stepping in at short notice to uh, start off earlier than they m might have anticipated. Um, but um, so good morning, everyone. My name's Nick Baker. I'm the Deputy Director for Engagement in the COP26 unit. And the COP26 unit is the team that um, organised the summit in Glasgow in November um, in the Kavanaugh office. Um, my team works with all the non-state actors, and um, so businesses, civil society organisations, so charities, faith organisations, youth groups, and many others, trade unions, um, and uh, building uh, support and getting everyone involved in uh, tackling climate change, both in the build-up to the summit last year, but also following it. Um, so we now have, the UK has the presidency uh, for, uh, for COP, uh, for the UNFCCC process, through till COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt in November this year. Our presidency actually started at the beginning of uh, the summit in Glasgow, um, although we've been working towards that for much longer than we thought we would with um, uh, uh, the uh, postponement of COP26 due to COVID. So we were working on it for a couple of years. So I thought I'd use this morning just to give a, uh, a flavor of what we were trying to achieve out of COP26. Um, what we did achieve out of it and a forward look to kind of the year ahead through our presidency and beyond. And obviously, as Gemma was saying, climate change is a huge issue that uh, we all need to work together uh, to tackle. Uh, and it's a long term issue. It's not going to be solved just with the summit in Glasgow or uh, the UK presidency through this year. So our approach to Glasgow was really to um, get everyone involved, as I was saying, all the organizations that I was, uh, that my team was working with um, to step up climate action and implement the Paris Agreement. We have this, uh, had this fantastic climate agreement, the Paris Agreement with really ambitious targets and it needed implementing. There were aspects of it that needed finalizing, which we did achieve at Glasgow, but really what we wanted to show was action happening uh, the agreement being implemented and uh, give a sense of momentum. And I was up in Glasgow for the full two weeks of the summit and it was it was fantastic, a real buzz, a sense of momentum, a sense of energy and all the uh, uh, participants from uh, a lot of different sectors uh, from all around the world, all kind of really committed to making the changes needed to, uh, to address this issue head on. Um, in terms of our, uh, uh, our work with businesses, what we were asking of businesses in the run up to COP26 and nothing has changed, we're still um, making the same uh, asks of business, is to sign up to science-based targets, commit to um, net zero targets by 2050 at the latest, but if not, uh, preferably much earlier, halve emissions by 2030, um, and publish a short to medium term plan of action plan of how you're going to achieve that target. The short to medium term plan being five to 10 years. The science based targets is a really important aspect because that's an independent way of assessing and monitoring uh, your progress on your on your target and delivery of your action plan. And if you achieve all of that, then you're pretty much uh, fulfilling all the criteria for uh, joining the Race to Zero campaign, which was launched in uh, 2020, and uh, which we're promoting and encouraging businesses, cities, um, universities, and other educational institutions, regions to sign up to in the run up to COP. <clears throat> um, so the, that Race to Zero campaign brings together a lot of other climate initiatives and acts as an umbrella, a one, uh, one place to go people sign up to that and they, they can be confident that they're delivering or they're on the right trajectory. And so that was what we were promoting. The, the race to resilience was also launched at the beginning of uh, 2021. Um, and that was the counterpart to, to race to, uh, to zero. So on the one hand, reducing emissions, cutting, uh, cutting emissions uh, through the race to zero. On the other hand, adapting to the consequences of uh, climate change and its impacts through the race to resilience. So 
so um, encouraging um, many organizations around the world to sign up to both of those initiatives. We were focused on five particular areas, five particular themes where we thought we'd make most impact if we reduced emissions and uh, gave a, 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 an impulse to, to action. And those five areas really uh, uh, chimed with what Gemma was saying in her presentation. And it was great to see some real practi uh, practical examples of how a business is implementing uh, these principles in its own operations. <clears throat> so the first theme, the first campaign that we had was on the power transition. That was primarily the move away from coal power. Uh, which is uh, kind of the, the dirtiest form of uh, power generation and accounts for a huge uh, amount of global emissions, um, but also accelerating the move towards uh, renewable uh, energy sources as well. And through that, promoting a couple of initiatives, one RE100, where companies and other organizations commit to making 100% of their energy sourced from renewable uh, sources, and another, a similar one, EP100, uh, which is about increasing energy efficiency, particularly in, in buildings. Uh, the second campaign that we focused on was transport and particularly road transport, where we wanted to accelerate the, uh, the transition to electric vehicles. Um, and there, similarly, there was a, another initiative called EV100 that we were encouraging uh, companies and others to sign up to to make all their fleets 100% electric vehicles. The third campaign was finance, and this is uh, really an issue of trust with many of the communities and countries most impacted by climate change around the world is uh, access to finance to be able to deal with the impacts of climate change and, uh, uh, and the transition needed to be able to reduce emissions. So delivering on a, a pre-existing international climate finance uh, commitment of providing $100 billion a year but going over and above that as well. So meeting that uh, international commitment by governments and uh, international financial uh, organizations around the world to meet $100 billion of climate finance per year. Fourth, were, and linked to that, was adaptation and resilience. So really building our resilience to the impacts of climate change, uh, whether that's building flood defense systems, early warning systems for storms, or adapting to uh, uh, food systems to increase uh, occurrence of drought and things like that. So adaptation, really important for those communities and countries, particularly small island states uh, that are most impacted by climate change. And the fifth and final campaign theme was nature. And that was about uh, moving to more sustainable ways of producing some key commodities, beef, uh, coffee, cocoa, soy, palm oil, which are mostly responsible for deforestation ar around the world, halting and reversing uh, deforestation and uh, really kind of, uh, uh, protecting nature. So they were our key themes. How did we do? Um, well, we were very uh, pleased with, the, uh, with what was achieved at Glasgow. Given the starting point, we wanted to keep the target set within the Paris Agreement of 1.5, the upper, the, the most ambitious end of the limit, alive uh, and it's it's certainly still within reach after all the commitments that were uh, made in Glasgow but it is still a stretch to achieve it despite all the commitments that were made um, so I mean we had 122 world leaders come together in Glasgow 197 parties so all the um, uh, all the signatures to the Paris Agreement signed up to the Glasgow Climate Pact which was agreed through the negotiations at Glasgow uh, which did uh, agree to urgently keep 1.5 degrees within reach. It also closed off some of the outstanding bits of the Paris Agreement that hadn't been agreed, uh, things like Article 6 on carbon trading um, uh, and other things. But it also brought in some new commitments that uh, really marked a step change in uh, the, uh, the rate of progress. So countries committing to come back at the, the next summit in Sharm el Sheikh with new and improved uh, national uh, commitments. So before that had been done every five years, now it's being moved to an annual basis. So real progress there. In terms of some of the campaigns that I was uh, talking about earlier, I, on the Race to Zero, we've now got over 5,000 businesses, members of the Race to Zero, over 1,000 cities, 
and over a thousand educational institutions around the world, which is a fantastic achievement over a, a fairly short space of time. Um, again, on emissions, uh, we now have 90% of the world's GDP or the world's emissions covered by a net zero target, which is brilliant. Um, on cash, we're now uh, on track to meet the 100 billion target I was talking about uh, earlier by 2023, and then go beyond that and be more ambitious uh, after 2023 for the following couple of years at least. Uh, but we've also leveraged private sector finance through the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, with now over $130 trillion of financial assets uh, being brought together by private sector uh, investors to invest in uh, uh, net zero projects, climate change related uh, projects. So a huge amount of finance being made available. It's now a matter of uh, getting it to where it's needed and make sure it flows. On adaptation, uh, 43 countries have now produced, uh, published an, an adaptation plan um, and linked to the nature, but also important for adaptation is that the commitment that was made on deforestation and halting it and reversing it with 130 or over 130 of the world's leaders committing to reversing deforestation by 2030. And that covered 90% of the world's forests. So kind of all the key uh, countries with huge forest uh, reserves in them committing to, the, uh, to, that, uh, to that pledge. The UK played its part as well in providing some financing behind that, so providing £500 million uh, towards implementing that commitment as well. Um, as the other partner, organ um, partner campaign to the Race to Zero, the Race to Resilience, has now got over 2,500 members of it. Um, some really great commitments coming in from businesses. One of the ones that was uh, that helped to launch the race to resilience was by Zurich Insurance, expanding their flood risk um, coverage to more countries and the amount available that uh, uh, people could access through its flood uh, flood risk insurance as well. Um, so some really great commitments there. And on some of the uh, key uh, sectors that I was talking about, um, power. So on coal. Uh, that all the G20 leaders have now committed to ending international public finance for new unabated uh, coal power generation. Um, so that's a big uh, move forward. We got a commitment in the text to phase down coal, albeit not phase out, which is what we had aimed for. And there's a lot of coverage of that, but it clearly shows move in the right direction and sig uh, signals that coal is on the way out. We had some great um, specific targeted initiatives. So there was a, a package put together for South Africa's, uh, for South Africa to move away from coal, uh, its energy company ESCOM um, particularly, and decarbonizing its, uh, um, its energy production. So eight and a half billion dollars being made available from various partners around the world to help decarbonize South Africa's energy system. And we had over 30 countries committing to uh, phasing out uh, um, uh, the uh, inter internal combustion engine and moving to all new car sales being electric vehicles by 2040 and 2035 in some leading car markets and also uh, leading vehicle manufacturers committing to the same thing. So a lot of things were committed to in Glasgow. In terms of the way forward through the next year, uh, uh, it's going to be a real focus on delivery and implementing those commitments. Uh, a lot of things were signed up to in Glasgow. Uh, it showed a lot of progress. We actually need to get more ambition. So if you add up all the commitments, it still doesn't reach 1.5. So when we come back uh, to uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt in November, we'll be looking for countries, uh, companies and others to make even more ambitious commitments. But there'll be a real focus on delivery and implementing all the commitments that have been made. I think that's a real issue for trust. Everyone saw the, the protests outside um, the conference in Glasgow, and that was about whether actually the change being made was, uh, was quick enough and whether um, what was being decided inside was sincere enough. So I think it's, it, it's a matter of tr trust to implement what was agreed and go much further. Businesses have a really key role through the commitments um, and action that they're taking. And I think a lot of time people can relate much better to that than they can to uh, rather uh, more 
intangible uh, commitments being made by governments. So real action by businesses makes a massive uh, difference. It's, uh, uh, people can relate to it, but also collaboration between sectors. That was a key theme for uh, COP26 was getting everyone to work together. So businesses, government, civil society organizations, academia, really coming together to collaborate um, to uh, uh, find the solutions that are needed to, uh, to face up to climate change. So delivery um, and integrity of the targets and commitments that were made uh, will be a really key theme through this year. And as I was saying, uh, hearing some of the uh, practical things that um, the Southern Co-op are doing and what's happening at the airport is all really great news. Um, and uh, I think there's a role to share experience across sectors. The smaller companies that might not have the resources, there's also uh, available an SME climate hub uh, that's uh, uh, been set up by the climate champions that uh, help, helps to support the race to zero and the race to resilience. So do look that up if, uh, if, um, if that would be helpful. Um, so there's plenty of resources and support out there, whether it's from partners or others. And the influence that businesses can have through your supply chains, with your employees, with your customers is, uh, is huge. So uh, I just encourage everyone to carry on uh, 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 with the climate action that's, uh, that's been uh, taken so far. And I think I'll end there and open up to, I think we've got questions. That's right, Nick, thank you. It's over to me to host questions. So thanks to Nick, uh, obviously to Steve and to Gemma. Um, and a reminder to all of you to post questions using, using the Q&A chat function. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Kerry Moore. I'm the Regional Director for the NatWest Corporate and Commercial Banking Business here in the Solent. Um, I guess we've got about 25 minutes or so of questions, so plenty of time. Thanks to those of you who've submitted some questions in advance. Um, I, I should say, Nick, I'm very proud to say that, uh, that the NatWest Group has committed to 100 billion of sustainable financing and funding between 2021 and 2025. I think it's important that all banks and financiers do their bit. Um, and, and that's definitely something that we're seeing our teams internally focused on in terms of developing products and areas that, that can help support business looking to undertake some of the transition that we've, we've heard about this morning. Um, I'm going to kick off with a question for you, Nick, if that's OK. And I, I think you've sort of referenced um, this, but I guess when you evaluate COP26 and having it in the UK, to what extent do you think that it's, it's really heightened the public's and consumer awareness? And I guess with that, you know, to what extent do you think it's created some urgency and some focus within business in those non-state actors that you've referenced? I think it definitely has uh, generated a lot of momentum, a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, the number of people getting in touch with us uh, in the run up to COP was quite incredible. I mean, but, I mean, we had quite a substantial team by the end of it. But even so, uh, with the number of people wanting to get involved, it was it was just great to see. And we ran a campaign in the run up to COP uh, called Together for Our Planet to try and get everyone involved around the country it was a real approach of the whole of UK. So, I mean, obviously it was held in Glasgow, but there was representation from around the UK at the summit. Uh, there was fantastic representation of businesses, uh, particularly our sponsors like NatWest. So we're hugely thankful to our, our sponsors for helping to uh, put on the event. Um, so I think it really did showcase uh, what was happening around the country. And you did really get a sense of momentum. And we had various advisory councils that we set up uh, for, the, for the COP president, Alok Sharma. So one of them brought together the main mayors from uh, around the UK. Another brought together a group of international businesses, many of whom were in the UK, to advise on planning for the, uh, for the summit and what we wanted to achieve out of it. So definitely got a sense of momentum. And I mean, the amount of media coverage of it, obviously around the summit was pretty much back to back. As you would expect, the interest uh, kind of wanes away after the summit um, in the summit itself, and that was to be predicted. But the interest in climate change is still there, and that's really important. Uh, I mean, the issue hasn't gone away. It's still a problem. We've delivered a lot, but we're not, as I was saying earlier, we're not on track to 
to be where we need to be. So I think the UK is, is leading the way and there's a lot that we can share, but we also need to be kind of humble about it, what we can learn from around the world as well. Excellent, thanks, Nick. Um, Julian, at the very start, talked about stakeholders um, and, and certainly in, in Steve and Gemma, your discussions, you talked about communication and how important that is. Steve, you talked about passengers um, and I think, Gemma, you talked about how you're communicating with your customer base through social media and others. Um, just interested in hearing a little bit more as to how you give that sort of customer voice focus and how you are um, tuning into what your customers, consumers and passengers are telling you and then playing that back. So, Steve, come to you first just around passengers and how you've you've kind of got the voice of the customer represented and and how you're listening to passengers and, and communicating back with them. Well, rest assured, the, the passengers aren't, uh, aren't shy in, uh, in coming forward. And, um, and whilst a lot of communications that we get are maybe sort of compliments or complaints about a specific time and a specific aircraft and a, a specific event, there's definitely an undercurrent of environmental and sustainability challenges coming through. And I don't mean um, the testers, you know, who are who are just sort of you know, banging, a, banging a particular drum. I mean, sort of passengers who were saying, you know, why are we using this disposable plastic? You know, your, your recycling bins aren't right. You need to change this, you need to change that. So I think social media is a brilliant forum for that. My challenge on social media is the fact that although I'm a big business, I'm not, I'm not large enough to be on there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there seems to be a, a demand, I'd say with politicians as well, there seems to be a demand for an immediate response as if we're just sat there waiting, waiting for somebody's call. And that's a real challenge. But we, we do the analysis of the, of the questions that are coming in, the trends that are coming in, and the environment is right at the top of the agenda if you take away the, the complaints about an aircraft being laid for, for whatever reason. Great, thank you, Steve. And, and Gem, I think you gave a, um, a really good flavour of how you are communicating with your, your customers, but um, can you talk a little bit about how you're listening to them and kind of gathering their views as inputs into your own planning as, as a board? Sure, absolutely. I mean, it is, it's, it's a two-way process, and particularly as a member organisation, the needs and interests of our members are kind of really important to us. So we've got formal mechanisms um, for that, which is through our things like our annual general meeting, we've got a membership and customer services team. Uh, so like Steve, we get a lot of stuff that comes through there and questions about what we're doing and particularly around sort of hot topics like packaging. We've also recently appointed um, a board ambassador for climate action. So one of our board directors has taken full responsibility for that. So she's providing that internal challenge, not just internally, but looking at how we can kind of build an engagement with our membership on this issue as well. Um, so we've got some things that we're planning um, over the next year. The pandemic's limited a little bit of what we can do, but we want to use things like events. Um, we do member listening groups. And I think this is particularly an area where we want to hear more about what's, uh, what's on our members' minds, what's important to them, um, an opportunity for us to kind of raise awareness and understanding of what we're doing. That's almost the starting point because this is, quite a complex area sometimes. So how can we demystify some of this and help people to understand what the issues are, why they're important and the steps we're taking as a business. And then to start that engagement to provide some of those inspiration and ideas about the things that people can do in their daily lives um, or in the workplace um, to make a difference as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Steve. Um, Thank you, Hugh, as well. Great question um, from Hugh Lumby for Nick. Um, so given the need to hit some ambitious but very necessary targets, do you think that business can uh, do all its contributions through voluntary changes? Or do you think that legislative requirements will be needed? Uh, and if the latter, any idea on timing on intent there? And I guess we've we've kind of seen a bit of carrot in terms of tax incentives, but perhaps, you know, Hugh's question is around the stick or the sort of imposition of, of targets on business. So Nick, thoughts there, please? Yes, and thanks to Hugh for the question. Really good question. I mean, it's something that we're debating at the moment, but I mean, a lot has been achieved through the voluntary targets so far. I mean, uh, a, a massive amount through kind of the science-based target 
um, initiative and through the, the Race to Zero campaign, a lot has been achieved that way. I, I guess the UK is already leading the way in a sense in that we announced in Glasgow the requirement for, um, for listed companies, publicly listed companies to publish their transition plans, which is a world first. No other country, as far as I know, has uh, committed to do something similar. Um, but whether they follow suit, I mean, we shall see. It might, uh, I, I, I should think a lot of countries will be looking at the UK's experience and what the impact is um, to, uh, to see whether they follow suit. So I think in a sense, uh, we're probably, I mean, in a lot of ways at Glasgow and in the build up to Glasgow as the UK presidency, we wanted to show leadership. And that was one of the ways in which we were doing that. So I think that shows a sense of direction in uh, for things to come. So a lot has been achieved with voluntary targets so far. Um, more regulation is beginning to come in, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's more uh, in the future. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, question in regarding just transition um, from Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and balancing climate change transition and adaptation with social mobility and leavening up requirements, um, seeking panel views on the challenges and opportunities here. I'm gonna link it to a question we had shared in advance of the session today um, and get Steve's view on it. And that question was, how can public and private partnerships be used to commercialize the net zero journey for local businesses? So that's that kind of social um, mobility and leveling up coupled with public and private. And I guess the Freeport strip of land attached to the airport perhaps plays into that so Steve did you want to kick off on this one? Yeah I think that the free port's a great opportunity so there's a, a piece of land to the side of our airport and it extends around the back of the, of the uh, railway yards and into the sort of chicken hall um, industrial estate and there's this huge potential for what we do there and I think it's really up to it's, it's up to the public as well to make sure that everybody's held to account, whether it's the, the private businesses ourselves, the politicians at Eastley Borough Council that were held to account to make sure that the incentives that are being get, uh, given for that area are put towards things like green technology. You know, it can't just be a blooming retail park. It has to be it has to be something that um, that hits this agenda. Um, that's why we that's why we've been given the opportunity as a free port site. So I think it's really important that you know, you know people keep keep track of this and um, and it's important that it becomes sort of green technology. I think I think that's going to be one of the key key issues for Southampton and for Eastleigh in the next four or five years, how that develops and what it develops into. And I hope the aspirations at the, at the front end are borne out by what's delivered at the uh, at the back end. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I think I think Freeport is a great example whereby um, for for the area to capitalise and be granted the permissions to, to to harness what Freeport can offer, that has to go hand in hand with you know sustainable businesses, the creation of jobs, um, levelling up and regeneration. So yeah, you know, I think unless those things are featuring, um, we won't get our detailed plans approved and. I don't think in this day and age we'll see the investment for it either. Um, so, so that hopefully gives you a, a flavour there, Joe. Um, scope three was, was talked about earlier and we had a question in advance just asking for the panel to touch on how they are looking to, to manage and measure scope three emissions across their supply chains. Um, Gemma, it looked like at Southern Co-op are sort of well into that evaluation to sort of baseline your, your carbon footprint. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and scope through emissions, please. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we've had a, um, a little bit of help from um, a climate consultancy to do that work to understand exactly what that indirect footprint um, looks like. And I think you saw on the chart the sort of breakdown of that and where the biggest sort of areas of impact are. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's looking at what we can realistically um, influence within that so I think there's a big opportunity for us particularly with our direct suppliers so obviously a lot of our suppliers we don't have that direct relationship with but particularly areas um, we have over 200 local producers and suppliers so we're just starting to think about how can we um, share our 
journey and what we're doing and actually look at what we can do to help um, those suppliers understand where they're at. I think some of those suppliers are already doing some great and innovative things already, but how we can start the conversation to think about what we could do potentially as a business to support them um, in setting their own commitments and targets um, and working their way along their own sort of climate journey. Thank you, Gemma. I'm going to stick with you uh, from the next question, Gemma, if that's OK. Um, you shared sure. with us and, and you rebranded them. And I thought that was great the way you've done that. I think you called them the world's goals or the global goals. Um, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You really picked out, I think, three to focus on. So do you just want to talk about how you went through that process of you know, what's a really busy and broad brush kind of set of goals? How you yeah. honed in on those that you thought would create the most impact and needed the most focus for you so sure. yeah I mean it can be quite daunting because there's 17 goals in to total which seems a lot so I think you know we looked at the goals um there's some great um websites out there and actually the, the sort of sustainable development goals website itself really helps to kind of break down each of those goals um and to try and translate the sort of top targets and KPIs that sit behind that into something which is much more easily understandable so I think we looked at what our business strategy was where we felt there was a good match. And, you know, there are kind of touch points with lots of those goals. So we're doing work, for example, around um, food, pot tackling food poverty through our community programs, which speaks to that zero hunger goal. Um, we're doing lots around health and well-being for our, for our colleagues and our communities. But I think we just really looked at it and thought about the things that we were doing strategically as a business and actually where we could have the greatest impact. And I think for us, just with the imperative as it is at the moment, climate action had to be um, the top priority. Um, but clearly, as a community based organisation, then we've got an opportunity to, as a community um, hub within those, uh, those areas, is to look at what we can do to help support more sustainable communities and cities. But a lot of that is not just um, doing that in isolation, but it's how we can work with local par partners, whether that's public sector, charities, um, et cetera, to sort of really create more sustainable communities around the sites that we have. And then I think the third one was quite naturally, you know, we use a lot of resources as a business. And I think back to the member side of things, you know, uh, in terms of issues that get raised sort of by our membership, then things like packaging, food waste are absolutely top of their kind of agenda. So they have to be things that we need to face into and tackle. Um, and we've done a lot of work in that area, but still still a long way to go. So I think, you know, using the things that are important to our stakeholders, our strategic business plan helped us to really sort of hone in and focus on the ones where we felt that we could have the biggest influence. Excellent. That's, that's really helpful. Um, question from Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. So our climate considerations and sustainability strategies of businesses starting to feature more in bank and other lenders credit assessments um, I, I would say absolutely um, I think that um, sustainable business uh, is is good for the sort of safety of, of business and the preservation of, of value and jobs and I guess you know the, the more and everything we've heard this morning um, tells us that, that businesses that, that are tuned into what their key stakeholders whether that be employees customers, um, the regulator, uh, you know, and, and their suppliers, if they're tuned into that kind of ecosystem of, of stakeholders as to, um, you know, what's important in climate and sustainability will be increasingly important to all of those stakeholder groups. You know, that's a reflection of a strong management team that is, that is forward thinking. Um, you know, clearly some businesses, industries are, are kind of heavy carbon users. Um, it's not about, um, you know, kind of vacating sectors en masse with lending decisions, but clearly there is an increased need for, for all businesses to, to have a transition plan and be seen to be planning for, um, you know, improving sustainability and, and, you know, considering the climate and the planet in, in how they are sort of running and operating their businesses. So, yeah, I think it reflects well on those management teams that are getting into this and, and building a plan. Some are are long into it. It's a great means of developing competitive advantage. Um, I, I think I probably speak for all banks, and you probably won't be surprised when I say it, that if business owners are putting their heads in the sand and thinking that climate considerations and sustainability doesn't really apply to them, um, 
I'd really challenge that. Uh, at the very least, it will be important to uh, your staff, if not already, and uh, and certainly your customers. Um, and that's before, as Nick's alluded to, you know, maybe some harder um, targets, uh, objectives are, or or penalties are, are forthcoming further out. So, so yeah. And I wouldn't say uh, it's restricted to lenders. I think you know, Larry Fink uh, dropped a, a famous letter, the dear CEO letter, didn't need to. Um, to, to business at large last year or so, um, just really serving notice that there will be a flight of capital um, away from businesses that are just not transitioning and not showing no interest and no accountability for for climate and, and planet and sustainability, uh, and quite the opposite, that flight of capital towards businesses um, that, that have a bright future because they are helping um, their customers uh, solve you know, the world's obvious problem. So hopefully that answers that one. I'm going to come back with a, a bit of a sort of top three question, um, which was shared in advance of today's session. So what are the top three opportunities and the three top risks um, for the region or I guess in general in the fight against climate change? So um, Steve, did you want to go first with that? Opportunities and risks? Yeah, I think the, for me the opportunity the opportunity is the is the free port. I think I've probably already um, uh, covered that in uh, in um, sufficient detail. But it, again, it, it's really important that we make the most of that of that opportunity, and that in five to ten years' time we can look back, we can see that now the Solent region you know is is a is a hotbed of excellence in terms of um, in terms of green technologies and the new jobs that are created through there. I think as well another opportunity is the geography. It was obviously because of the, um, the, the the maritime heritage that we have, uh, to a lesser extent for the region, the aviation heritage. But those links to the Channel Islands, mm -hmm. I'll be doing everything I can to make sure that um, that when we're uh, we're testing and trialling uh, electric aircraft, um, you will see, for example, even today there's a little 14 seat they're heading off to Alderney. You know that that is perfect for the for the test bed for electric aircraft. Same within Scotland with the Highlands and Islands. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And and Gemma, did you want to talk about again op opportunities and risks as as you see them, be it for the region or or for your business or sector? Yeah, I mean, I think there's um there's a huge amount of pressure on kind of resources and space, I guess, across our our region. Um, and I think it's just how we kind of balance some of the, I suppose, take a more holistic approach to some of the decisions that we're making because that infrastructure um, is coming under pressure. So how do we kind of really um, make kind of decisions across the board that creates a really green and kind of sustainable infrastructure? I mean, particularly, um, I mean, I talked about sort of nature stewardship and I think, you know, we've got sort of two national parks sort of in our kind of area with the South Downs, we've got that marine environment. Um, and we are kind of, we have some very densely kind of populated um, cities. So actually how do we start to kind of really um, invest in nature and recognize the importance of those green spaces, not just for the benefit of wildlife, for the benefit of um, tackling this climate crisis, but also for people's own health and well-being as well. Um, so I think that's a particular um, critical area for, for, for me. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're sort of coming to the end of, of questions, um, just so that we don't uh, take you beyond 11 o'clock. So, you know, just to say thank you to, to Steve, um, to Gemma and to Nick for answering questions, but most of all to those of you who posed questions in advance uh, and who've posed questions in the Q&A chat function um you know we're still running for a bit longer so if there are any other questions um i think there might be one or two for us to pick up after the event um then then we can do that and uh, uh but without further ado i think i'm now handing over to um the president of the hampshire chamber peter taylor to do a wrap up and summary peter over to you Barry, thank you very much indeed and uh thank you to all our panelists um for a really insightful session and I hope that all of you have um, feel that you've got something of value uh, out of the last hour and 20 minutes. Um, for me, uh, climate change, the drive to net zero is an issue for all of us. Um, it is not an issue for one sector, it's not an issue for one business, 
it's not public sector, private sector, we're all in it together. And indeed, um, as we've heard uh, from our panelists, this spirit of collaboration, which has really come to the fore over the past um, 22 months, can really make a significant difference um, in this drive to net zero. And for Hampshire, where we sit at the moment and where we live and where we work, um, I think we have a huge opportunity to make a, a difference, um, not only for the current generations, but for, for future generations, our, our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids, and to set the standard uh, and create a real legacy for them to, to enjoy and to thrive. And after all, from Hampshire Chambers uh, of Commerce perspective, we are very much about being the voice of business in the county, but it, creating thriving businesses through helping them grow and through helping them develop. As everybody touched upon, and in, in particular, probably going back to what Julian said right at the outset, um, this climate change and climate action for businesses is both a commercial imperative and a commercial opportunity. It's not a, it's more than our social conscience and being responsible for the environment and for the climate. Um, there's a great book written by uh, a person that many of you all have heard, of course, uh, about Simon Sinek, and he talks about the infinite game. And that's about the need to stay on the pitch in business. And for me, it is important, if you're gonna stay on the pitch and continue to be in business, taking part in climate action and making a difference in your, in your own way in your businesses is part and parcel of that. It is only by doing so will, that you will stay within the supply chain as we've touched upon already. But also importantly, as we're all seeing for the war on talent and attracting the skills that you need to drive your businesses forward, that younger generation for them the environment and climate responsibility is a huge issue. And they will select employers who have not only a policy, but a measuring difference uh, in terms of their carbon footprint. So from a, a Chambers of Commerce perspective, we are keen to show real leadership here. Uh, I have recently taken on the role of president and uh, two things are very much on my agenda. One is collaboration across stakeholders so that we don't trample over each other. Um, we are using our talents and our resources to best effect. Uh, and we are, have been working with other stakeholders, whether it be the local authorities, whether it be the LEPs, um, to ensure that we are creating that thriving community for the whole of, whole of Hampshire. But also for me, climate change and net zero is huge. Uh, and we have the talent within this county, within, within the parameters of this county to drive change for ourselves. Clearly by the number of you who are on the call, um, we've got a strong nucleus of people for whom this is an important issue. Um, but we are supported by the universities, by the colleges, by the schools. And Astrid has kindly posted in the uh, in the chat about the skills labs that are, is a partnership between the LEP, the chamber and the colleges where net zero is an issue and it's it's an opportunity for businesses to to share learn best practice um, and understand just how they can make a difference i think start the starting point for many will be to understand where you are at the present uh, and I know that uh, Natalie also posted in the chat that she'd um, had some support from B Corp uh, in terms of understanding where they were in terms of the sustainability piece and setting an agenda to help them get through um, in terms of measuring their, their carbon footprint and in particular those scope one, two and three emissions. Uh, and there are other resources that are available and the chamber is on hand to help all members and all businesses across the county um, find those, those uh, points of reference and find that support. And together, and I mean together, we can affect change 
we can show leadership to the rest of the country in many ways. Um, Hampshire is strategically important nationally and internationally. We know that we are attracting attention from foreign investors. They are looking at us because we um, are uh, rich in that talent. We are a key trading uh, entry point uh, for, uh, for the country as a whole. Um, but they also want in terms of investing to see that we are taking some action around climate change and net zero. So collectively, we've all got a role to play um, for the county as a whole. But as I said earlier on, in terms of staying on the pitch and staying in the game, uh, we, need to do, we need to take action. And if we do that, we will seize competitive advantage. We will attract that talent um, that at times feels that is, it's, their fortunes are best served elsewhere. They will want to stay. Uh, and uh, I would say we will be a force for good as a, as a group of businesses right across the county, whether we're large, whether we're small um, or medium size. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you to our panelists, uh, to Nick, to Gemma, and of course to Steve. Uh, thank you to the co-hosts, Carrie and, uh, and uh, Julian. And of course, to Vicenza for also providing the, the IT host platform for us. Um, I wish you a very good day. Uh, have a great weekend, uh, however you spend it. Um, and there will be more to follow over the